In this talk, I want to reflect on the diverse journeys that different Christian believers over recent centuries have taken towards embracing some version of a hope for universal restoration. I should say right up front that I have no interest whatsoever in this talk in persuading you of the truth or otherwise of the convictions these people had. I'm simply trying to map out features and aspects of those journeys and of their experience. One of the striking things that stands out from a study of the history of hopeful eschatologies is the way in which universalism seems to be spontaneously rediscovered over and over again. Of course it's not hard to find people who were converted to universalism directly through the preaching or writing of another. Nevertheless, it is fascinating how many people seem to move into a belief in universal salvation seemingly without the influence of other universalists encouraging them to do so. Let me give two quick examples. In 18th century Britain, one of the evangelist George Whitfield's converts was a Welshman named James Relly. He became one of Whitfield's itinerant evangelists for nine years until they parted ways over a theological difference. The difference? Well, Relly had come to believe that Christ saves all. This change was prompted when Relly had an encounter with a man who challenged his evangelical account of the atonement. How, the man asked, can divine retributive justice be satisfied in the cross if God is there punishing an innocent person in our place? Justice punishes the guilty, not the innocent. So how is the cross a manifestation of justice? This problem deeply troubled Relly, and so he set himself to respond to it. He immersed himself in scripture and developed an account of Christ's ontological union with the human race. This union was such that what was true of Christ was true of us, and what was true of us was true of Christ. Thus, while innocent in himself, Christ was made sin through his union with us in our sin, and God was thus just to punish sin in him. Relly reasoned that because God had already punished the sin of all humanity in the cross, it would be unjust to punish the same sin again by sending anyone to hell. And so he argued that all must be saved from hell already. The preacher's job, he thought, is to persuade people of this fact so that they can enjoy the psychological benefits of such knowledge. In this way, Relly reasoned himself to a universalist conclusion on the basis of his desire to defend the penal substitutionary account of the atonement. A very different journey was that of Jane Lead in the 17th and very early 18th century. Lead was part of a small group in London who adhered to the work of the Teutonic mystic Jakob Böhm. Later in life, she claims to have been the recipient of a vision in which divine wisdom herself revealed to her the truth of universal restoration. Lead claims that she was very cautious for some time about rushing either to dismiss or affirm the vision because its content was so shocking to her she was eventually persuaded by her reading of the scriptures to embrace it wholeheartedly. Her first publication on the matter appeared in 1694 when Lead herself was 71 years old. Here we have two very different stories about how individuals came to believe that God will save all people. One originating in a puzzle over a theological doctrine, the other in a religious vision. And one could mention a whole host of others who similarly stumbled on their own towards belief in universal deliverance. I'm not suggesting that these diverse journeys into a belief in the final redemption of all were not influenced, indeed deeply influenced, by other Christians or by inherited Christian theological ideas. Of course they were, every one of them. My point, rather, is that each of these characters found their own way towards belief in universal salvation without the direct influence of other universalists. 
the theology of other universalists might subsequently serve to refine and confirm that initial insight, but my point is that the insight was not taught them by another universalist. What's fascinating about this deviancy from the mainstream is that it keeps on happening. Perhaps we might even dare to speak of universal salvation as the perennial heresy, echoing the way that Aristotelianism and Platonism are sometimes spoken of the perennial philosophy. Of course, I'm using the term heresy in jest because I don't believe that universalism is a formal heresy. It would be a mistake, however, to overemphasize those who stumble into universalism on their own. Many more became universalists under the influence of other universalists or their writings. They found the universalist views surprisingly resonant with their existing Christian faith. An example. In 18th century America, Baptist minister Elhanan Winchester went on a protracted journey into belief in universalism, and this was sparked by a book called The Everlasting Gospel by a German pietist writing under the name Paul Siegfolk. In 1778, Winchester called to see a friend who put a copy of Siegfolk's book into his hands. Winchester's friend didn't know what to make of the book, and so he asked Al Hannon to explain it. Winchester dipped in here and there for perhaps 30 minutes, quickly got a feel for what the book was arguing. I had never seen anything of this sort before in my life, and I seemed struck with several ideas. But as I was only desired to tell what the author meant, when I had satisfied my friend in that respect, I laid the book down. And I believe we both concluded it to be a pleasant, ingenious hypothesis, but had no serious thoughts of its being true. And for my part, I determined not to trouble myself about it, or to think any more in the matter. Some time later, he was visited by an acquaintance from Virginia, and among his books, Winchester found a copy of, you guessed it, The Everlasting Gospel. He read a little more of it this time, but wrote, as yet, had not the least thought that ever I should embrace his sentiments. Yet some of his arguments appeared very conclusive, and I could not wholly shake them off. But I concluded to let them alone and not investigate the matter. And therefore, I never gave the book even so much as one cursory reading. During a 12-month preaching tour between South Carolina and Pennsylvania, he would stay with friends, often fellow ministers, and he would sometimes engage them in discussions of Siegfeld's arguments. Winchester would play devil's advocate and would defend the universal restoration to see what kinds of responses and rebuttals they would propose. To his surprise, even the most able ministers were at a loss not knowing what to say and the defences of endless punishment that were offered served not to soothe Winchester's doubts about the traditional theology of hell, as he had hoped, but to increase them. Nevertheless, he continued to resist the doctrine with all his might, and he said, sometimes preached publicly against it with all the force I could muster, yet it had got under his skin. He describes himself as half a convert by the time he arrived in Philadelphia in 1780. We'll come back to his story later. What I'd like to do first is take some more time to explore the range of roots and the elements of those roots and the journeys that people take into some kind of more hopeful eschatology. So let's consider the diversity of the journeys that different people took on their way into embracing a universal restoration. I maintain that we can observe in all those journeys a complex and varied relationship between the roles of scripture, tradition, reason and experience. And while for certain individuals one or two elements in that quadrilateral may loom large, all four of them will be playing some role because they're all interconnected and mutually inform one another. We could picture the relationship between them as in this diagram.
a little explanation is in order. I don't think that reason should be thought of as a separate element in the quadrilateral so much as the way in which the other elements are reflected upon and relate to each other. So in the diagram, think of reason as a part of what makes up the arrows. Thus, when a philosopher or a theologian is making out an argument for or against hell, he or she is using reason, but is reasoning about the teaching of scripture or of tradition or about human experience. Reason, at least as far as this discussion is concerned, doesn't have its own content. Of course, it's also true that the other three components can't really be conceived adequately apart from each other, as each of them is intertwined with the others. For the sake of time and simplicity, however, we shall treat them as distinct. All of this is simply to say that all of these factors will play a part in the story of an individual's conversion to belief in universal salvation, but they can't be disentangled in a tidy way. Nevertheless, the dominant trigger element will vary from one person to another. So first, let's take some time to explore the roles of the role of experiences in these journeys. And we'll begin by considering everyday kinds of experience. Mundane experiences can play a role in a Christian's reflections on hell and salvation. So let me give you five quick illustrations. First, think of your own everyday understandings of what love is, what it means to love someone. That to love a person is to seek their best interests, to promote their good. This experienced, shaped understanding complicates the doctrine of hell, for hell as traditionally conceived does not seem to promote the good or the best interests of its inhabitants. After all, it's not remedial nor restorative in any way. Rather, it inflicts irreparable harm. Reflection on our ordinary experience of love generates a tension between a belief in hell and a belief in divine love. And this conflict has played a role in the journey of many people into universalism. Second, and related to the first, we might think of the 19th century holiness preacher Hannah Whittle Smith, who became a convinced universalist. She says that her experiences as a mother with her children profoundly shaped the way that she came to think about God. Most of my ideas about the love and goodness of God have come from my own experience as a mother. This was one component in her journey towards belief in universal restoration, for she couldn't believe that her love for her own children was superior to God's love for his. I'll say more about her conversion later. Third, consider our experience of love for friends and family who are unbelievers, that is to say people who are traditional candidates for damnation. We know from everyday life the way in which our own happiness is bound up with the happiness of our loved ones. When they rejoice, we rejoice. When they weep, we weep with them. It was reflecting on this that caused Friedrich Schleiermacher in the 19th century and Thomas Talbot in our own to argue that the eternal suffering of the damned in hell would forever tarnish the joy of the redeemed in heaven. Hell thus appears to undermine the glory of heaven, which is a problem. Fourth, Think about the human experiences of the horrors of extreme suffering and the way that it can strip the meaning from life. This similarly makes traditional notions of hell troubling, for hell itself seems to be the ultimate instance of extreme suffering, depriving a life not only of the good in it, but also of any hope for future good. Such hopelessness is psychologically ruinous. And how, many have worried, can this be considered a good way to treat a human being made in the image of God? Or, fifth, 
consider our lived experience of free will, which indicates that our freedom is highly constrained and damaged. The philosopher Marilyn Adams argued that in examination of the psychological development of our capacity to choose indicates that we start life ignorant, weak and helpless, incapable of choice, and through a long and difficult process influenced by deeply flawed people and situations beyond our control and comprehension, we develop habits and dispositions that shape our ability to choose. Our freedom is fragile and impaired. And all this is before we consider the impact of addictions, trauma and such like. Choice matters. It's important. But choosing hell, she says, is surely beyond us. Such impaired adult human agency is no more competent to be entrusted with its individual or collective eternal destiny then two-year-old agency is to be allowed choices that could result in its death or serious physical impairment. Now let's take some time to consider some more unusual religious experiences and the role that they might play. Because in addition to these mundane experiences that we've just considered, there are the more extraordinary spiritual experiences that play some role in universalist conversions, or at least in some of them. The best known of these is the showings of Julian of Norwich, which I will leave Ilaria Romelli to speak about. And I've already mentioned the transformative role of the purported revelations given to Jane Lead through her divisions of Divine Sophia. In more recent times, one could look to the Pentecostal Bishop Carlton Pearson in the USA, whose journey into Universalism was almost instantaneous, prompted by a charismatic experience while watching a news report. But it will be helpful to give a more detailed example, and I've chosen to do that of George de Benville. He was uh, born in London in the 18th century, 1703, he was a son of Huguenot refugees from France. As a teenager, he felt a profound sense of his own sinfulness, so much so that he fell ill and experienced a vision of himself burning in hell. This state of turmoil continued for a further 15 months until one day, feeling a deeper sense of his guilt than usual, he simply let go and abandoned himself to the judgment of God. He writes, I discovered between justice and me, the criminal, one of the most majestic appearance, whose beauty, brightness, and grandeur cannot be described. He cast a look of grace and mercy upon me, and regarded me with such love as penetrated my whole being, and animated my soul with so pure a flame that I loved him again with a reciprocal love. He persuaded me in my heart that he was my savior, mediator and reconciler. De Benville sensed Christ praying for him before the Father. He then heard a divine voice declare that his sins were forgiven. Unable to contain himself any longer, he wept with joy and gratitude. This experience was life-changing for De Benville. And so overwhelmed was he with this revelation of the depth and breadth of God's saving love and the efficacy of the atonement that he became convinced there and then and for the rest of his life that this atoning love extended to all humanity. It also sealed in him a passion to preach the gospel to others so that they too could know this divine love. The French Calvinist ministers in London became very concerned about George's new convictions unsurprisingly, and met with him to discuss matters, but they couldn't agree on anything. For they held predestination, and I held the restoration of all souls. Having been the chief of sinners, I could not have a doubt, but the whole world would be saved by the same power. It's interesting that the very core of de Benville's evangelical conversion experience was understood by him to contain the seeds of restorationism. As far as we know, he was not aware of any others who taught universalism at this time. 
Unsurprisingly, de Benville was excommunicated by his church and went to continental Europe to preach the gospel. But his story also helpfully illustrates a second role that unusual religious experiences can have in journeys into and through universalism. That is to say, that for one who is already a believer in universal restoration, such experiences can reinforce, expand and deepen that conviction. After about 18 years of preaching around what is now Germany and the lowlands, he became seriously ill from stress caused by his own concern for the plight of lost souls. In his near-death state, he experienced a vision in which he was assured that he would soon see the restoration of the human species without exception. His health continued to deteriorate to the point that he was thought to be dead. He himself felt his soul separate from his body. He was presumably in some kind of coma. In this state, he experienced visions in which the most holy trinity, that was de Benville's favourite way of naming God, the most holy trinity sent out angels to guide him on a tour of the seven zones of hell, where he saw the suffering of the damned and felt, he says, great compassion towards the sufferers. After leaving hell, a messenger was sent to reassure him that the Most Holy Trinity always works wonders in all times within his poor creatures, without exception. You shall return into your earthly tabernacle to publish and to proclaim to the people of the world an universal gospel that shall restore in its time all the human species, without exception, to its honor and to the glory of the Most Holy Trinity. He then witnessed the multitudes of the heavenly host worshipping the triune God. He was next taken back to hell and saw that there was no more darkness or pain, all was quiet. Suddenly the host of heaven shouted, An eternal and everlasting deliverance, an eternal and everlasting restoration, an universal and everlasting restitution of all things. Then the damned were delivered from their sin, and clothed in white robes, they joined the heavenly host in worshipping God. At this point he was taken on a tour of the five heavenly mansions, and there he met Adam, who told him, This love of God in Christ Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, shall not only gain the victory over all the human species, but also surmount or overflow the kingdom of Satan entirely, with all the principalities of the fallen angels, and shall bring them back into their first glory, which they had in the beginning. He awoke from the vision and found himself in a coffin, having been assumed dead for 41 hours. Needless to say, his prior universalist convictions were strengthened. Sometimes earlier religious experiences can be seen in a new universal perspective after starting down Apocatastasis Road. An example, Elhanan Winchester, the Baptist revivalist preacher in the USA that we've mentioned before. He had a dramatic conversion to evangelical Christianity as a teenager. Later in life, after he'd become a universalist, he looked back on his evangelical conversion experience and saw universalist impulses in it. I had such a view of Christ as to make me cry out, Glory to God in the highest. This is salvation. I know this is salvation. I saw the fullness, sufficiency, and willingness of Christ to save me and all men in such a manner as constrained me to venture my soul into his arms. And if I had 10,000 souls, I could have trusted them all into his hands. And oh, how did I long that every soul of Adam's race might come to know the love of God in Christ Jesus. And I thought I could not be willing to live any longer on earth unless it might please God to make me useful to my fellow creatures. Being a hyper-Calvinist, he suppressed the universalist seeds in this experience and only later in life did he look back and come to believe that this early experience of Christ revealed more than he dared to appreciate at the time. These experiences, both the mundane and the more exceptional, 
play differing roles in the journey of an individual towards embracing ultimate restoration. Some, like de Benville's, de Benville's conversion experience, lead directly to an embracing of universalism. This tends to be the case with the more unusual religious experiences. They carry a sense of conviction and revelation with them that more mundane experiences do not. Other experiences prompt further reflection on scripture and doctrine, which in turn can lead to universalism. We saw this with Jane Lead, whose vision of Sophia provoked further thought and study of the scripture, but did not immediately lead to her to affirm what she came to call the everlasting gospel. Religious experiences obviously have an impact on their subjects, but they can also have an impact on others who hear about them and become aware of them. I'll illustrate this point with two very influential pietists from the 17th and 18th century, Johann Peterson and his wife Johanna, both friends of Philip Spenner. Johanna had struggled with the doctrine of hell since her youth. She also had what she took to be divinely given dreams concerning the end time conversion of the Jews and the heathen. However, what led her and Johann to embrace the restoration of all things was a book by Jane Lead about her vision of Sophia. They read with scepticism at first, but then suddenly there was a stillness in both their spirits as if someone had interrupted them and there came into their minds the words spoken in Revelation chapter 21 verse 5, Behold, I make all things new. Johann writes, We came to understand that God is essentially love, and that his unending mercy would pour itself out on all his creation. And notice too, that the experiences were not placed beyond criticism, but were submitted to the correcting authority of the Bible. Johann and Johanna Peterson sought to provide Leeds theology with a more solid biblical foundation. As radical pietists, they appreciated the value of charismatic visions, but they believed that everything must be tested against scripture. Johanna Peterson, who unusually for a woman in her day was quite an amateur theologian, corrected certain aspects of Leeds' chronology of the Restoration to bring it more into line with her own pneumatic interpretation of the Book of Revelation, a modification that Johanna says Jane Lead herself appreciated. Johann Peterson was able to modify aspects of Jane Lead's universalism in an attempt to fix other problems with it. Now, religious experience was much more prominent in 17th and 18th century universalism than in the 19th century. The universalist denomination in America, as it embraced the Enlightenment valuation of the centrality of a certain mode of rationality, actively distanced itself from the emotional excesses of revivalism, which they felt could bring the cause into disrepute. Similar suspicions of dreams, visions and revivalist emotionalism can be found in 18th century universalists in America like Charles Chauncey and John Murray. In a similar way, some of the hopeful universalists in the 19th century mainstream denominations were concerned with respectability and were not given to visionary religion. But for the most part, it would seem to be true that many universalists were open to the charismatic dimensions of Christian experience and allowed them a place in the life of faith. Now let's take some time to consider the role of scripture in journeys towards universal salvation, or a belief in it. Because for some converts, intense study of the Bible was the key factor that led to their change in perspective. They may not have even been looking into the issue, but the issue came looking for them. Here's an example. The Reverend Charles Chauncey from the 18th century, celebrated minister of the First Church in Boston, a bastion of enlightened congregationalism. It seems that Chauncey discovered universal salvation all on his own through his reflection on scripture. He tells us that his study of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 21 to 28, which incidentally is the Bible text most cited by patristic universalists. This text, he says, opened his eyes to consider all of the scriptures in a new light, which he then went on to do. It was this 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21 through 28, indeed, that first opened me to the present scheme, serving as a key to unlock the meaning of many passages in the sacred writings. This he did with meticulous care. While Chauncey's exegetical work drew on the insights of other biblical scholars, none of them were universalists, and he seems to have come to his radical conclusions all on his own. Elhanan Winchester's conversion involved a range of factors, but the decisive key was his own diligent searching of scripture and testing out the various views against it. He'd been pondering the biblical and theological arguments for universal restoration for a couple of years, when others discovered that he was exploring that possibility. As he was the minister at the First, church, the First Baptist Church in Philadelphia, this was something of a scandal. Seeing the storm brewing, he decided to work out once and for all what he thought about the question of universalism. And the deciding issue was this, was it a biblical teaching? If not, he would retract it. If it was, he would embrace it with all his soul. He shut himself up in his room, read the scriptures and prayed for enlightenment, seeking to be open as best he was able to whatever he felt that God was revealing to him. The outcome of this was, I became so well persuaded of the truth of the universal restoration that I was determined never to deny it. Let it cost me ever so much, though all my numerous friends should forsake me, as I expected they would, and though I should be driven from men. And if one reads through Winchester's many works, one quickly sees that the vast majority of his writing on universal salvation is a discussion on the meaning of biblical texts. For Winchester, theology was biblical exegesis. And he was clear that if scripture taught a non-universal salvation, then he would be obligated to follow its lead. But the situation is more complicated. One's reading of the Bible could be opened up in fresh ways in the light of experience. So let me tell you a little more about Hannah Whittle Smith's journey towards universalism. During her years with the Brethren, she became increasingly disturbed by their Calvinist teaching on election. Try as she might to believe it, she found it revolting. I felt that if this doctrine were true, I should be woefully disappointed in the God whom I had, with so much rapture, discovered. However, in 1873 she had a religious experience that set her on a course towards universalism. She was on a tram in Philadelphia and was in anguish over the effects of sin. Then God seemed to answer her in an inward voice, saying, in tones of infinite love and tenderness. He, Christ, shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 11. Satisfied, I cried in my heart, Christ is to be satisfied? He will be able to look at the world's misery and then at the travail through which he has passed because of it and will be satisfied with the result? If I were Christ, nothing could satisfy me but that every human being should in the end be saved, and therefore I am sure that nothing less will satisfy him. First, notice that although it's a religious experience prompting her reorientation, that experience took the form of a Bible verse from Isaiah coming to her mind with unusual clarity and conviction. On the basis of this, she reasons to her universalist conclusion. And the first comment she makes in her autobiography after this is, And with this a veil seemed to have been withdrawn from before the plans of the universe, and I saw that it was true, as the Bible says, that as in Adam all die, even so in Christ should all be made alive. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 22 As was the first, even so was the second. The all in one case could not in fairness mean less than the all in the other. I saw therefore that the remedy must necessarily be equal to the disease. The salvation must be as universal as the fall. This illustrates just how tangled up experience, scripture, reason and tradition can be. 
She then rushes to search the scriptures and was amazed to find it illuminated in new ways as her eyes were opened to perceive what had previously been hidden, the final restitution of all things. She writes, I turned greedily from page to page of my Bible, fairly laughing aloud for joy at the blaze of light that illuminated it all. It became a new book. This fresh view of scripture both reinforced her new conviction and helped to give it a clearer shape. Whenever it comes into the frame, scripture traditionally played a fundamental role that every Christian universalist had to take seriously. So finally, what about the place of tradition? In some ways, Given the dominance of eternal conscious torment in the tradition, it would seem that a certain sitting loose to tradition would be a requirement for exploring the possibility of universal salvation. And there is some truth in that suspicion. The Reformation with its sola scriptura and its rejection of certain traditions in the Church created the potential space within Protestant communities for imagining non-traditional possibilities regarding hell. One can see that many of the Protestant Universalists were overt in dismissing traditional views in the name of fidelity to what they saw as the true teaching of the Bible, which had been obscured by tradition. Many of them gloried in their rejection of tradition, finding great pleasure in mocking it and boasting of their elevation of scripture in opposition to it. Of course, it's true that there's a certain amount of self-deception here because these believers were simultaneously profoundly indebted to the very tradition that they thought they were rejecting in their theology. It shaped their faith in deeper levels than they realised. They thought they were Bible-only Christians, but there is no such thing. The place of tradition in our tale, however, is more complex. For some, it was the rescue or the recovery of a sideline part of the tradition, the teaching of Origen and his theological heirs like Gregory of Nyssa, that opened the door to hope. This was the case in 17th century Britain, with Bishop George Rust and some others influenced by the Cambridge Platonists. There we can see the recovery of some Origenist interpretations of certain biblical texts and the role that these readings played in the rise of universalism in this period. Even those who may not have read Origen's work seem to have become at least indirectly influenced by its recovery. Numerous parallels with Origenian theology suggest that this was probably the case with Jane Lead in the late 17th century, and it was likely the case with numerous others. The importance of tradition was even more in focus for those 19th century Anglicans who refused to shut out the possibility of the redemption of all. People such as Frederick Farrer, Edward Plumtree, and Thomas Allen. As good Anglicans, holding a deep respect for the Catholic tradition, they invested considerable effort in demonstrating the presence of universalism in mainstream church history. Thomas Allen in particular, a patristic scholar by training, argued in great detail that apocatastasis was far more wide widespread among the church fathers than is usually imagined. The recovery of the larger hope in the early church is a major factor behind the revival of hopeful universalism among some Orthodox and Catholics in the 20th century and beyond. The likes of Sergius Bulgakov or Hans Urs von Balthasar. For them, tradition was perhaps the key provocation towards openness to universal salvation. For Thomas Allen, the situation was starker still. He felt that eternal hell, although having been embraced by large parts of the church, was actually incompatible with the central creedal core of the tradition, generating impossible conflicts within Christian theology. In his mind, universal salvation was necessary precisely in order to preserve the core elements of the tradition, protecting them against the erosion caused by hell. Everlasting hell was the cuckoo in the nest of orthodoxy, a Trojan horse threatening the tradition from within. It was definitely the case that reflection on certain 
traditional doctrines and their implications played a key role in the rise of universalism and in many of the journeys we could examine. For some this may have involved a more parochial doctrine, such as the critical role that penal substitution theory, which is very important in classical reform traditions, played in driving James Relly into a kind of Calvinist universalism, and we considered him at the beginning. Or the way that reflection on reformed doctrines of predestination and election took Friedrich Schleiermacher and Karl Barth in creative new directions. Evangelical tradition also factored into the way that those like Elhanan Winchester played off Calvinism and Arminianism against each other. Winchester argued that each of those two evangelical traditions had undesirable implications. Calvinism creates problems for God's love, while Arminianism creates problems for God's sovereignty and victory. Universalism, he thought, affirmed the best insights while rejecting the problem as problematic aspects of both traditions. It was, in his view, the perfect via media, and evangelicals, he thought, had every reason therefore to embrace it. For many, the traditional Catholic Christian teachings about divine love, creation, fall, the work of Christ in his incarnation, death, resurrection, God's final defeat of evil, and so on, played a critical role in their move to universalism. The perceived difficulty for such Catholic theology by attempting to assimilate the doctrine of hell into the mix played some role for most of those whose stories we've considered. One may wonder why this universalism keeps on reappearing throughout church history. Some put it down to the devil's lack of originality. However, I would argue that the chief impulses behind the deviancy in its many Christian versions are integrally related to deep Christian convictions about God's love and goodness and justice, about the dignity of humans in his image, about the victory of Christ over sin and death, and so on. It seems to be those very convictions that raise doubts about hell as eternal torment and push in the direction of a larger hope. In other words, perhaps the seeds of this hope lie not in some Gnostic lie or infidelity to scripture, but in the gospel itself. And if that is the case, then for as long as Christians continue to believe in the gospel, there will remain an inherent temptation to follow it towards conclusions that push beyond the mainstream tradition off the prescribed course in the pursuit of a wider hope.